Tonight, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson is no longer in the DUP, but his shadow looms large over the biggest unionist party. So what exactly is the political fallout from those dramatic few hours on Good Friday? As the clock ticks towards a general election, we'll ask our experts what next for the DUP and the new man in charge. Plus, the politician hoping to replace Chris Heaton-Harris as Secretary of State says a border poll is a long way off. As Keir Starmer said, it's not even on the rise at the moment because insofar as there are indications of what public opinion is in Northern Ireland, there is no evidence at all that there would be a majority. Hello. In the space of a week, Geoffrey Donaldson went from dining in the White House to being questioned in Antrim police station before being charged with rape and other historical sexual offences. Those are charges which he denies and says he will contest. It was a development that shook his party and the whole political system. Good evening, you're watching BBC Newsline. One story dominates our programme tonight. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson has been charged with rape and other historical sexual offences and has stepped down as leader of the DUP. It's been a devastating revelation and has caused tremendous shock, not just for myself personally or my colleagues within the DUP, but for the community right across Northern Ireland. It came as a great shock. The job of a seismologist is to predict when earthquakes are coming. This, I think, is a political earthquake that no one saw coming. It takes something to shake Northern Ireland's battle-hardened political landscape, but this certainly has. It has been a political bombshell, you could say, like no other. My priority as First Minister is to provide that stability, to work with all the other party leaders, all those that form our executive. We're a four-party coalition, and I think now more than ever what we need to see is cohesion. There's no leadership um, challenges at all. Uh, Gavin will, will continue as interim leader, and the rest is for interim internal party business. He is suspended from our party. That's a decisive decision that we took um, and that remains the case. So in that scenario, he cannot be a candidate for the DUP. I believe that unionism has a very strong and capable leader in Gavin Robinson. He has my full support and I know that he has the support of unionism right across the piece. What's really important is that institutions uh, should be able to function through them uh, and withstand uh, any disruption that may occur. I'm devastated by it as I think most people are and still at times hard to believe that within a week, ten days, the world has changed so dramatically. Just a flavour of what have been uh, a dramatic few weeks for the DUP. Let's discuss the political implications and fallout from that now with my guests. Professor John Tong from the University of Liverpool. Ben Lowry, the editor of the newsletter. The Belfast Telegraph's political editor, Suzanne Breen. And our political correspondent, Gareth Gordon. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for being with us tonight. Um, Suzanne, first of all, Geoffrey Donaldson's departure and the circumstances of that departure did cause a political earthquake. What are the consequences in your view? Well, I think DUP headquarters are very nervous and understandably so. They will have had a game plan for the situation post-deal, but there will be no game plan. There will be no game plan for Geoffrey Donaldson departing the political scene. And, you know, th th this is totally uncharted territory, not just for the DUP, but for any party in Northern Ireland. No leader has left the stage. Um, the DUP's already kind of behind. We have a Westminster election later this year. It was on 30% in 2019. It's on 24% in the polls. So the DUP needs to make up ground. It needs to do so rapidly. And it's very hard to believe that this won't cause the party political damage. Geoffrey Donaldson was such an asset to the DUP and the, the party marketed itself around his brand just a few weeks before he left. It had a political broadcast and he was there on a football pitch calling people to join the DUP team. The broadcast lasted two or three minutes. There wasn't a single other DUP politician in that broadcast. Last year's local government elections, we saw him um, on a building site. He donned a hard hat, a yellow high-vis vest, and the whole message was, Geoffrey can fix it. And, you know, the, the party now is in a situation where it, it can't even refer to him by his first name. It really needs to put distance between his brand and it, and that's going to be really, really tough. Um, 
Ben, Suzanne's talked there about the consequences for the DUP. I wonder what you think the consequences are for the party and perhaps more broadly for unionism itself. Well, the first thing I would do is go back to what happened after the return to Stormont and what didn't happen. I said in broadcasts, including this one, that I couldn't really see a return to Stormont without a rupture in the DUP. And I said that after talking to people across the party um, and senior people in the party. It just seemed that the difference of opinion was too great. But that didn't really happen. I mean, we had Sammy Wilson and Lord Dodds and Lord Morrow making clear their opposition to the deal, even their contempt for the deal, you could say. But often these were speeches in the Lords that we reported, but other people didn't. And, and they, they, they were not criticising Sir Geoffrey. So it couldn't have gone better for Sir Geoffrey. That's the context, a very important context to this. What's happened now is the shell shock. There's still the shell shock within the DUP. I mean, I think everyone is shocked. And I think that there's no sense that anybody thought that something was wrong. People who are very well informed, rumbling in the undergrowth, that this was going to happen. So one thing that could happen is that the shock, in the same way that it sort of healed the divisions, at least temporarily, you have Carla Lockhart, who was not particularly sympathetic to the deal, although she wasn't that explicit. You have Sammy Wilson, who was explicitly opposed to the deal making clear their loyalty to the party and will that will that hold i don't quite agree with suzanne that they'll necessarily be damaged they could be grievously damaged in a three-way election we don't know it's also possible that the unionist electorate will react to the shock the way the dup itself reacted which is rallying round the biggest party and isn't that what's likely to happen more isn't the evidence so far that the party is coalescing at the moment um even more around the leadership of Gavin Robinson because of what has happened. Yes, so what I'm saying is that I'm not sure if this is your question. What I'm saying is that it might be that voters, unionist voters, you're asking about the effect on unionists, react the way the senior politicians in the party have done. They rally around the DUP. But again, I'm finding it hard to see anything other at the moment than a three-way unionist electoral split because we have reform in Jim Allister and the TUV making clear that they are going to contest seats even if it might be a seat that unionists lose. They think it's too important an issue. But you also have a very significant win of the Ulster Unionist Party that really sees itself as between alliance and unionism. I'm not saying all oh, they're entirely happy about that. And they're not that thrilled about it. Apart from in England, they think that if they have pacts in some seats, they might lose votes. Okay. So that's, that's a very big element of uncertainty in this. OK, Gareth, it was unquestionably a dramatic departure. What, for you, are the likely consequences? Well, I think I'm safe in saying, Mark, <clears throat> this is a story like no other we have ever covered and probably never will. Um, you must remember that this time two weeks ago, as far as we were concerned, Geoffrey Donaldson was at the height of his political powers. He had, perhaps against the odds, steered his party back into uh, Stormont. He had become the leader that many felt he never had been in the past, and he appeared all powerful. Then suddenly overnight, literally overnight, he fell as far as any political leader could fall, and the party acted swiftly, and nobody I can speak to sees any way back for Geoffrey Donaldson in the world of politics. That's irrespective of what happens in the judicial process. And we must say again, he is apparently going to contest these charges. So he's gone from the stage. He's left now <coughs> Gavin Robinson as deputy leader. It's the ultimate damage limitation exercise at the moment. It's the ultimate hospital pass that Gavin Robinson has been handed. Nobody is trying to make hay out of it in the DUP. Nobody is talking about fighting Gavin Robinson, who will presumably be... Uh, there'll be a coronation at some point. We're not quite sure how that works, to get him from interim leader to, to, to full-time leader, whatever the word would be. And then he's got a... a Within a few months, he's got to fight a very perilous general election. It was already perilous. His own seat in East Belfast is probably the most vulnerable DUP seat. Were Gavin Robinson to lose that election, and he will point out he's won three general elections in difficult circumstances, were he to lose, then the party would be looking for its sixth leader in, in 15 years. That's unthinkable, because there's nobody I know of who knows who would follow Gavin Robson, were that to be the case. Also, Lagan Valley, I think we'll talk a little bit more yeah. about that later on, Jeffrey Donaldson's own constituency. The party at the minute is all over the place with that one, uh, as I understand it. They're looking for a candidate, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then for Stormont, there was a fear, I think, initially, which seems to have gone away, that um, perhaps without the 
Geoffrey Donaldson at the helm, DUP's commitment to Stormont would be a little bit um, loose, let's put it that way. That does not appear to be the case, but of course we wait to see what happens with the legislation and the RSC border in the coming months. So it couldn't be more difficult time for this to happen. There is never a good time okay. for this to happen, but there's no way the DUP could have foreseen this coming. And I think they're still trying to work out, like we are, what they're going to do about it. John Tong, I'm interested in hearing your perspective from uh, Liverpool. What, what's your assessment of where this uh, dramatic development leaves unionism, and I suppose in particular where it leaves the DUP? Well, obviously the DUP was shell-shocked, but there is some short-term good news for the DUP. Uh, Gavin Robinson has the loyalty of his party, un unquestionably. Uh, no one else wants the job. There won't be a contest for new DUP leader. If there's going to be any interest in a contest, it will be for deputy leader, where we might see uh, a debate over the ideological direction of the party. Uh, and those MPs who were uh, had expressed considerable disquiet over what was termed the Donaldson deal, well, we know that they remain uber loyal to the DUP. That might be simply because they know where the votes lie within unionism. It's also because they, they don't see a future outside the DUP at all anyway. The DUP is the unrivaled leader of unionism. It was the DUP that said no uh, to the recent idea of uh, you know this um, umbrella, uh, anti-protocol umbrella, because the DUP, many of the DUP were not necessarily committed to permanent opposition uh, to the protocol. So in the short term, there's good news. The DUP is committed to Stormont. It, it, they, look foolish to try and uh, disrupt Stormont this side of the general election. It will be a hugely reckless electoral strategy. Beyond the general election, though, uh, and there are there are clearly problems. Gareth's just out outlined them. If Gavin Robinson was to lose his seat, yes, you could still co-opt him into the Assembly to try and keep him as leader, but that would look borderline desperate, and frankly, more desperate than, than it looks borderline, that's for sure. So, you, you know, you would be on more leaders than the Conservatives have had uh, in the, themselves in the last five years. And you can see the direction of travel uh, for the Conservative Party if you want a comparison. So they, the, the thing the DUP now has to do is to decide what its election message is, because you've still got disquiet over what was termed the Donaldson deal. You've had Ian Paisley over the last few days saying, we're going to perhaps present a more realistic appraisal of that deal now. In other words, a fairly thinly veiled critique of what might be seen as the overselling of the deal. If the DUP goes into the election with mixed messages, forget it. They will lose East Belfast. They will probably be looking for a new leader. Uh, and the party could be back to a level of seats that we've not seen since the early 2000s. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment or two. Um, I think we need to be clear about this, Gareth. The, the, the DUP will, and you've touched on it already, will obviously want to underline that Geoffrey Donaldson being charged with historical sex offences is entirely separate from the party. And the party will want to make sure voters don't look at DUP candidates in the general election campaign and think about what happened on Good Friday and how things may subsequently play out in the courts. But at the same time, the Orange Order's Mervyn Gibson referred on talkback to a certain element of unionism being dejected and that being added to by the events of Good Friday past. He talked about disillusionment, he talked about apathy and unionism needing to give itself a shake. That is now the challenge for the DUP. And there's not much they can do about that. We don't know what way this will affect people's voting intentions. Logically, it shouldn't. If you were a DUP supporter before this, you, unless something has changed in your mind, you should still be a DUP supporter. These are charges against one individual who's no longer a member of the party. Nonetheless, I've spoken to a lot of people about this. Um, one person said people are very fickle about why they vote. Um, it might affect the vote in Lagan Valley, I was told. The question is, can people decouple the allegations from the party? You don't know the answer to that question. Gavin Robinson doesn't know the answer to that question. And every, if you're going to grind every individual voter, it will probably put some people off. But the longer the general election is down the line, perhaps in the course of a general election, people will not vote on this issue. But some may. Um, Suzanne, let's talk about some of the constituencies that we've already highlighted that could be particularly difficult. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about East Belfast in a second or two, but what about Lagan Valley itself? Um, the situation there for the DUP it is an unknown at this stage. We were, we were talking on the Red Lines podcast a couple of weeks ago about what the possibilities might be for some of these difficult seats as far as unionism in the DUP in particular is concerned, and none of us knew clearly at that point what was about to happen. 
none of us knew, and I think we, we all thought that Geoffrey Donaldson was a cert um, to be re-elected. He, he, he was going to run and his political star was high. And I think that has all changed utterly um, in the past few weeks. We can see that Sorsha Eastwood ha is, is upping her game. She's on social media um, constantly. She's out on the ground in the constituency saying, here I am. Um, she's not saying Jeffrey Donaldson isn't here, but that is clearly the implication of what she's doing. And I think Alliance headquarters now will really be throwing um, a, a lot of effort into Lagan Valley and they will see a real opportunity to have an Alliance MP in the constituency. Um, John Tong, can I ask you, uh, this is your area of expertise, East Belfast, Lagan Valley, South Antrim, a real challenge for the DEP as well, potentially to try to win back North Down. Some people even suggesting, I mean, before any of this happened, that somewhere like East Antrim could potentially, under certain circumstances, be in play. How big is the electoral challenge that Gavin Robinson and other leaders within the DUP face, you know, within three to six months' time? It's absolutely huge. This is a very high-stakes uh, election, partly uh, because Gavin Robinson's leadership is at stake, and also because it, it only needs the DUP to lose two seats, and Sinn Féin, if they hold their own, uh, become the largest party uh, at Westminster, not taking their seats. Of course, they would complete the hat-trick in terms of largest party status. I, I think East Antrim will be stretching it, uh, and at the recent Alliance conference, I said, I said to Socialists, but I didn't think she she had much of a chance at all in Lagan Valley. But when the facts change, you, you change your mind. And, and clearly, the facts are very different now in Lagan Valley, and, and that seat is very much in play. In South Antrim, I think the Ulster Unionist Party has, has pulled a smart move. Not normally a party always associated with its uh, electoral acumen, but in this case, putting Robin Swan as their candidate there, uh, I think gives uh, the UUP a real chance of taking the seat from the DUP uh, so there's a lot of marginal seats, or at least semi-marginal seats, in Northern Ireland. The DUP is under electoral pressure to an extent we haven't seen in perhaps at least half a generation, possibly a, a full generation. Um, ben, this is an interesting one. I wonder how big you think the challenges the DUP is potentially facing at the polls come election time, in particular from the new TUV Reform Alliance. We know Jim Allister, the TUV leader, has talked about um, Alliance Party being full of crypto-nationalists, as he puts it. You will know the argument that suggests a TUV slash reform challenge um, could actually award the Alliance Party additional seats mm. in places like East Belfast and Lagan Valley. There is a feeling um, in sections of the TV, the same as within reform itself towards the Conservatives, that things are so serious that you almost need to potentially have a scorched earth election in which the DUP suffers so that it doesn't do things like say that there's no Irish sea border when there, um, when there obviously is. And by the way, I'm agreeing that there obviously is. Getting rid of checks is not getting it's not legislative change. I think, though, an apop apocalyptic uh, election for unionists. You were also asking in an earlier question about unionists in the DUP. I think that that's less likely. I think that if East Antrim was lost, it would be it's a very unionist uh, seat, probably to another unionist. That would be somewhere where the TUV would expect to do well. If South Antrim was lost, it would be lost to another unionist. The unionists could still win. They've always done well in Fermanagh and South Tyrone. And the other thing is, I think it's important also to say this about Lagan Valley. In the last election, which was pretty disastrous for the DUP in Lagan Valley, I'm talking 2019, um, unionists combined got 65% of the vote. In an Alliance doing well to an unseen degree. So it, re it remains a very unionist seat. I think the threat, to, there is a threat to Lycan Valley. The threat to Lycan Valley is potentially three candidates in unionism. It's, uh, but it's still a very unionist seat and there are lots of very unionist seats still. OK, uh, Gareth, I think, did you want to add something about Lagan Valley in particular? Lagan Valley is a real dilemma. It's the, probably the number one problem on Gavin Robinson's uh, entry at the moment because there are two MLAs, DUP MLAs in Lagan Valley, both of whom are in the executive. One, of course, is Emma Little Pengelly, who originally, many moons ago in a different world, was uh, going to go to Westminster. Uh, Geoffrey Donaldson was going to come home to be first minister, he hoped, or deputy first minister. That clearly is not going to happen now. Emma Little Pengelly is performing 
very well for the DUP. She's a, she's a, a counterbalance to the female First Minister. She is very articulate. She's across the details. She's performed well on media. And, uh, not inconsequently, she seems to be better at hurting than, uh, than Michelle Hornig. That was maybe so a surprise to I don't quite know a few that people. Emma Little can get the DUP particularly keen to move her out of that role at the moment, or that she would be particularly keen to go. What can happen? She could win and then she, she has to leave Stormont, or she could lose and return as a very wounded Deputy First Minister. Paul Given. Paul Given, I understand, has no interest in going uh, to Westminster, but doesn't mean he wouldn't do it. It doesn't mean he wouldn't do it, but it, it certainly isn't what he's... And one other name. Let me give you one other okay. name uh, that I was given tonight as a possible... Johnny Buckley, the upper ban MLA. Uh, this was, is as a candidate? As a candidate. Um, a part of Upper Ban has moved into Lagan Valley and constituency boundary changes. Don't forget, he challenged Gavin Robinson for the deputy leadership yeah. last year, and he was head of the chief of staff, which would keep that side of the party happy. And that side of the party isn't necessarily as happy as they appear. I'm told that uh, people have been sidelined. That needs to stop. I asked who who have been sidelined, and I was told supporters of the Reverend Ian Pearthy. So while nobody's going to challenge Gavin Robinson, certainly this side of an election. That issue is not necessarily uh, settled. OK. Um, Suzanne, you've got a story in today's paper that two DUP elected representatives remain on Geoffrey Donaldson's payroll, working on behalf of the MP in his constituency office. Gavin Robinson said earlier in the week there was no contact on a party basis whatsoever. That's a direct quote. These two employees um, are not working for Sir Geoffrey in their capacity as elected councillors, but you've reported that both of them work out of the DUP's Lagan Valley constituency office. Could Mr Robinson have been more transparent in his answer to that question on Monday's talkback? Well, I think people will think maybe that it would have been better if Gavin Robinson had volunteered this information and put it in the public domain um, rather than a, a newspaper then having to dig it out and report on it. I mean, this breakup between Geoffrey Donaldson and the DUP is complicated and it's messy. And I think, you know, if there's anything else like this, then the DUP really needs to put it out there. One of the councillors is Geoffrey Donaldson's office manager and his personal assistant. The other one, works um, as a caseworker and the DUP they really should have got ahead of this story, put it all out there. Um, I'd just like to say on East Belfast, I think the DUP will be praying to God that Naomi Long doesn't stand and doesn't challenge um, Gavin Robinson. Party headquarters believe that she won't and, you know, they know her appeal and that the, they would much prefer another Alliance opponent than she would. Because if, if Gavin Robinson did lose, this is not like when Peter Robinson lost and he was he, he had another job, he was in the Assembly, he didn't need to be co-opted. Co-opting Gavin Robinson into the Assembly would look really, really bad, particularly when we have an unelected Deputy First Minister in Emma Little Pengelly. OK, we're out of time, folks. Um, there's plenty more we could talk about, but I suspect we will touch on an awful lot of it in the, the weeks and months ahead. Thanks all very much indeed for joining us on the programme tonight. Now, if the polls are to be believed, Sir Keir Starmer will be in Downing Street by Christmas and the veteran Labour MP Hilary Benn could well be the new man at the NIO. He's been Shadow Secretary of State since last September. He spent the past few days in Northern Ireland when he joined me in the studio earlier today. I began by asking him for his impression of the new executive three months in. Well, I am very impressed by the start that the First Minister, Michelle O'Neill, and Emma Little-Pengeli, as Deputy First Minister, made. Um, they've shown a very strong partnership. When I was in Washington recently for the St. Patrick's Day event, Northern Ireland was the star of the show. Everybody wanted to hear from the new First and Deputy First Minister about what they're doing, how they're going about it. I have talked to a number of ministers. I've obviously had conversations with them. It is a challenge. They're getting down to work. It's such a breath of fresh air after such a long period with no functioning institutions at all. And the people of Northern Ireland deserve stable government, and now they're getting it. And the single most important thing to ensure is that those institutions and that government and that work continues. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people would agree with that sentiment. At the same time, it has to be said, um, we must now be approaching the end of the honeymoon period. There have been an awful lot of photo opportunities and not so many tough decisions being taken, that has to come to an end. And politicians are going to have to grapple with very serious issues sooner rather than later. Do you accept I that? I would agree with that, yes. Um, and 
the issue of funding is something that the politicians are going to have to deal with. Um, the UK government has made it very clear that it wants to see revenue raising measures introduced and so far um, Stormont ministers seem reluctant to go down that road. Um, do you think it's fair to ask Northern Ireland taxpayers to pay more um, w when there is an acknowledgement that we are currently being underfunded? Well, Northern Ireland has been underfunded, and one of the things that came out of the negotiations was the agreement on a fiscal floor of 124% compared with, um, uh, uh, with England, for example. Now, they have taken one decision, which is to raise the rates a bit. That will raise, as I understand it, £31 million this year and £31 million next year. And they have got the agreement of the government in the discussions that have taken place subsequent to the executive being re-established to do that over two years. So they're part of the way towards the £130 million that the government uh, said they wanted to attach as a condition to the £3.3 billion settlement. Yeah, they certainly haven't met it, though. They have not met it yet, but they will take a little longer to produce the fiscal sustainability plan. I, I accept the argument that they have made that to do that by May was really too quick, and I think the government now accepts that. But government, being in government, is all about, as you know only too well, taking decisions how you raise revenue and what your priorities are for expenditure. So the question that people will want an answer to tonight, Mr Ben, is if you find yourself in the position of being Secretary of State on the other side of a general election, whether that is um, in June or July or whether it's in the autumn, will executive ministers in Northern Ireland have a more sympathetic ear in you than they currently have in Chris Eaton-Harris? Well, future negotiations about the budget will fall to whoever is the Secretary of State and the UK Treasury. And it's not for me to come onto your programme tonight and to make spending commitments. But the reason I've spent so much time since I took up this job meeting people, talking to people, listening to people, learning from people, is to understand the scale of the challenges. Now, if you look it's a big at... big challenge, isn't it? They're huge. Well, let's take the health service, the worst waiting lists in the whole of the United Kingdom. Despite the fact that... Leave on one side the question of historic underfunding, there the money that has come to Northern Ireland, what is going to be done? What is the plan to deal with that? Because I can tell you, if my constituents were waiting the length of time that people in Northern Ireland are waiting to see a consultant to get an operation, well, they'd have a lot to say about it. And it falls to the health service, to the health minister and to the executive to come up with a programme that is going to ensure that those long waiting lists begin to fall because the people of Northern Ireland would expect nothing less. OK, one issue that could fall to you is whether or not to call a border poll. Your predecessor, Peter Kyle, pledged that an incoming Labour government would set out the criteria for the calling of such a poll. Will you? No, because there is a criterion already. It is written in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And as you will be only too well aware, it says a border poll shall be called by mm -hmm. the Secretary of State when he or she is of the view that in the event that a poll took place, a majority of people in Northern Ireland would vote for a united Ireland. Most people would say, frankly, with respect, clear as mud, because nobody knows precisely upon what basis such a decision would be made. Well, I mean, oh, let, tell us what criteria you would use to make that decision. In the end, it is a political judgment by the Secretary of State. Now, the people who wrote the, people who wrote the Belfast Good Friday Agreement debated long and hard, and every word, every sentence, every paragraph was carefully considered. And they came to the conclusion that the way to answer the very fair question you put... Now, personally, I think it's... As Keir Starmer said, it's not even on the rise at the moment, because insofar as there are indications of what public opinion is in Northern Ireland, there is no evidence at all that there would be a majority. So that is for the future. But it is a political judgment. And the alternative, Mark, is for somebody to say, right, it's going to be based on five polls over four months by three reputable companies showing a lead of X percent over what period. You cannot take a decision on that basis because, apart from anything else, people will then focus on, well, how can we 
uh, shape the polls that are going to be called upon. It is a political judgment. It's very clear. There is one criterion. And when the moment comes, if and when and as it comes, the, a Secretary of State, whoever it is, will know the responsibility that rests upon them. After 14 years of Conservative government, do you think the union is stronger or weaker? Well, that's a very broad question, because take the union as a whole. Are you talking just about Northern Ireland or other aspects? Well, specifically about Northern Ireland, yeah. Well, the government has done some things, for example, the Legacy Act, which we are committed to repeal, mm -hmm. which has managed to unite, quite rarely, all of the parties in Northern Ireland against it. And I think they've damaged the relationship with the Republic of Ireland, uh, both because of that and also because they tried, having agreed to sign the Northern Ireland Protocol, to undermine it. But just to be clear, do you regard yourself as a unionist? Well, I am not advocating for a united Ireland. The Labour Party is not advocating for a united used to, Ireland. Used to. The Labour Party is not advocating for a united Ireland, and nor is, I mean, the current UK government. And the other bit of the Good Friday Agreement, going back to the border poll, it is for the people of Northern Ireland to take that decision for themselves, yeah. without impediment, without, you know, no let, no hindrance. And then, of course, it is for the people of the Republic uh, at the same time to decide whether they want to do that. Yeah, but... In terms of a straight answer to a straight question, you, you should be able well, to tell me, are, are you a unionist? Do you feel like a unionist? I mean, Ray, you know, uh, Boris Johnson made himself a minister for the union when he was prime minister, and he talked a lot about his unionism. Keir Starmer, I think, has made it pretty clear that, um, that he has unionist tendencies. I think that's fair to say. Are you a well, unionist? Well, I, I am not advocating for a united Ireland. Well, are, is, you, are you is. advocating for uh, no. maintenance of the union? I'm not advocating for united I'm de facto. Uh, it, it results in what you have just said. It is for those who favour a united Ireland to advocate for it. And the point about the Good Friday Agreement is it said you want to campaign to remain as part of the United Kingdom, that is absolutely a legitimate aspiration. You want yeah. to campaign for a united Ireland, that too is a legitimate aspiration. And there is a mechanism now, which we've discussed at some length, okay. for determining whether that happens or not. But you raised the issue of uh, legacy uh, a moment or two yes. ago. You're on the record as saying, you've said it again tonight, you would repeal and replace the British government's current legacy legislation. You will know very well, of course, that one of the bodies set up under that legislation, the ICRIR, is due to begin operating in just a matter of weeks and is currently recruiting staff. Are you absolutely clear tonight that Labour will scrap that organisation? No, I'm not going to say that this evening because repealing the Legacy Act has to come with replacing it with something. Now, you have to break it down into its component parts. It looks like immunity, having been struck down in the Belfast High Court in the judgment recently, well, that will be appealed up to the Supreme Court, but it was a pretty clear judgment. Uh, I'm not sure that that is going to survive. I would bring back inquests and civil cases. It cannot be right in a part of the United Kingdom that people are not able to seek a civil remedy or to have an inquest to look into the death of their loved one. Everybody I have met agrees you need a mechanism, one for providing information to families who have been really badly done by over many, many years when it comes to the death of their loved ones, and you also need a mechanism where there is evidence to enable prosecutions to happen in the future. And the question is, okay. what is the most effective means of doing that? And I am committed to going back to the principles of the Stormont House Agreement, which the government originally accepted and then destroyed by introducing the Legacy Act. Henry Ban talking to me earlier. Let's pick up on some of the points he made there. Suzanne Breen and Gareth Gordon are still with me. Um, Suzanne, what did you make of Mr Ban's comments about a, about a border poll clearly reversing away from the previous comments of his predecessor, Peter Kyle, who had committed to clarifying the criteria if he was to become Secretary of State? Well, I don't think anybody in nationalism watching that will think we've got a friend in Hillary Benn. They won't think that they've got an enemy, but they certainly won't see an ally who will move the whole debate on in terms of a border poll. Hillary Benn, just like his, his leader, Keir Starmer, is a status quo man. He's not going to do anything um, to, 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 to up, upstage anything. Um, he, he's just going to sit on this. He's very much somebody on top of the detail. I think he's probably not going to 
to be great for journalists here because some of his Tory predecessors haven't been that good and they've, they, they've walked into things. He's a safe and steady pair of hands. Um, Gareth, are you a unionist? Feels like a straightforward enough question, but he seemed pretty reluctant to say that he is. Did, did that um, leap out Unlike his at father, you? Of course, he was anything but a unionist. Well, indeed. Quite the opposite. But I just think probably he doesn't see any reason to give you a hostage to fortune this far out. Um, so he is sitting on the fence. So we will see more if Hillary Benn becomes Secretary of State, if they will win the election and he becomes Secretary of State. Uh, we can push him more on that. But at, tonight, he wasn't going to go there. And uh, as for a border poll, he repeated what Keir Starmer said to me. Uh, it wasn't even the, on the horizon. And would it, it would have been incredible had he been uh, said anything else and given what his leader said. And uh, just briefly, Gareth, no guarantee in that interview, at least, that there'll be a bumper cash injection for the executive if Labour well, wins the election. Again, hostage to fortune territory. Uh, he, he, why would he show his hand this far out? I mean, he wants to come here on cruise control. He doesn't want to have to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. He hopes Humpty Dumpty stays where he is. So he, he, we will learn more about uh, Hillary Benn uh, if and when he becomes Secretary of State. I don't think he's going to give away too much in advance of that. Mm. It's interesting though he's been here since uh, he's been here since Sunday, um, so he's met an awful lot of people in the last um, uh, five or six days. Um, I just want to go back to the previous conversation that we were having, and uh, it's worth pointing out, Suzanne, that we did invite Gavin Robinson, uh, the interim leader uh, of the DUP, to take part in tonight's programme, but we were told he wasn't available. Um, one interesting point we, we touched on it. Just just want to pick up on it again for a second or two more. Uh, the leadership's position in the DUP always was that the Irish Sea border had gone post the, uh, the, 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 the latest agreement with the UK government. Um, and then on Monday's talkback, Gavin Robinson said, well, no, it hasn't gone, but it will go if, the, uh, if there's the faithful implementation of the framework uh, document and the command paper. Um, and that, of course, may have kept some of, his, um, uh, of those on his flanks happy, but it has opened him to criticism from the TUV and reform. Absolutely, it has. And you have to wonder, has Gavin Robinson now got the worst of all worlds? Geoffrey Donaldson had been clear, the Irish Sea border is gone. I don't think that that was accurate, and I think Gavin Robinson is probably being more honest. But telling voters, oh, it, it might go at some time in the future, definitely does leave him open to Jim Allister, to the TUV, and to Jimmy Bryson. It just really absolutely muddies the waters, and the DUP don't need that. They need strong and steady leadership. And they have to be able to clearly answer questions on the Irish Sea border, which it doesn't look like at the moment that they can do. I think, I think you said they were waiting for legislation and it would be gone by the autumn. And I think if you notice um, Ian Paisley this week on uh, Good Morning Ulster talked about this being a work in progress. Uh, nobody wants to be, uh, from that side of the party, it would appear to me, wants to be seen to be capitalising okay. on, on a, an already difficult situation at the moment. OK, got to leave it there. Thank you both very much indeed. Uh, that's just about it for tonight. I'll be back the weekend with uh, Sunday Politics at the usual time of 10 o'clock on BBC One and iPlayer when we'll be examining the struggles school principals are facing in managing their budgets. For now, though, from everyone in the team, thanks for watching. Have a good night from all of us. Bye-bye.